Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Um, you know, it was a few years ago, actually. Um, you know, sometimes when God, when I kind of hear from God, it, it happens at night when I wish I was sleeping. And God will start speaking things to me. Um, you know, think, speaking things to me, you know, for our church. Or, and even when, when this was spoken to me, I feel like this was even before I got here. Uh, you know, I think it was even in just when COVID started, you know, 2020, which is four years ago, which is remarkable. Um, that God was speaking uh, to me. Uh, and, and it kind of came to me, um, and it was the start of the locked room. And I don't know if you've ever done a locked room. But basically what a locked room is, it's just an activity that you can do with some friends where they lock you in a room and you have to use whatever you see in the room uh, in order to get out, some clues, whatever. Now, I've never done a locked room. Um, I, there's a part of me that wants to and there's another part of me that's like, I don't know if I want to because what if I fail? Um, what if I can't get out of the room and then I'm stuck there forever, right? That's kind of how my mind goes. I'm just joking. You don't get stuck there forever. They let you out eventually, all right? Um, in fact, there's even this, this guy, and I don't, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but he's, he like is this viral guy for going around and locking locked room doors with like chains, locking them inside their own thing. Anyway, I'm not saying it's a good thing, okay? But that's just what this one guy does. Um, but the locked room is this idea of being in a room with your friends and trying to escape. They call them escape rooms or locked rooms or locked doors, whatever. Um, and I've never done one. There's part of me, you know, I probably will do one one day, but it's this, it's this idea of being locked. And today we're going to start a new series called The Locked Door. And, uh, yeah, The Locked Door. And we're going to be, I'm going to be sharing a message called Locked in Fear. And I'm going to be going through, um, through this message, some of the things that we get locked in as followers of Jesus, some of the things that we get locked in as people um, that, that really can cause a havoc and cause problems in our lives. And this is what God started speaking to me, you know, several years ago. And I think that fear in our world is really running rampant. I think fear is growing. It's growing not just in our children, but growing in us as adults. And you see this on social media. You see this on the news. You see it all over. That fear, fear sells, right? Like fear, people love fear. In fact, there's an entire entertainment industry towards scaring people. You know, when it comes to movies or, or, or whatever it is, that, that fear is something that I think we've almost become so comfortable in that we don't know what it's like to not be afraid. That we're so caught up in, in fear and fear kind of has run our lives. But there's this moment in, in scripture that depicts this scenario of being locked in a real way. It's a moment where our heroes of the faith are locked behind closed doors. These are the same guys who had earlier seen Jesus do the miraculous, seen him feed thousands of people, seen miracles, seen, seen deliverance, seen people healed. They had seen so many miraculous things and storms go down and they've seen it all. But there's this moment where they, they saw it. They had seen the power of God firsthand, yet they were lost because they felt that they had lost the power. They felt that they had lost what they'd experienced. They felt that they had lost it all. And we can read it here in John 20. It's a portion you might know, John 20, verse 19. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. So what they did is they met together, but they were so afraid of even their meeting together that they locked the doors behind them. You know, for, for them, they, because what had happened is they had just seen their friend, they had just seen their rabbi, they had just seen their teacher, their leader, their savior, brutally humiliated and murdered on a cross. The man that they had dedicated three years of their lives to, who gave up everything, gave up their careers and often family to follow Jesus. They saw the, the door close on the tomb and they thought that was the end of the story. This is where the disciples found themselves on the Sunday night. Maybe some of the questions being like, Matthew being like, yo, should I go back to tax collecting? I made good money doing that. You know, some of them may be like, should I go back to fishing? Should I go back to my career as a fisherman? And, and, and there was these conversations, I think, because they were meeting together. What were they discussing? I think they were discussing the future. 
What do we do? Jesus is dead. And now I think they might be coming after us as well. It's a scary place to be if you imagine yourself in this moment. The thinking, should we flee and go to a new place where people don't know us? Where should we go? Are these leaders, the, the Jewish leaders, are they gonna try and do the same thing to us? Are they gonna take us and put us up on a cross because we followed Jesus and we followed his teachings and we followed his way? Are they gonna come after us as well? Imagine the fear that they would experience in this moment. There's a lot of fear that would come up. What is the future going to look like? Their entire livelihood was gone. Three years of their life wasted. And this is exactly what fear does to us. It, it tricks us that the safest place to be is being locked in a room. That the safest place for us to be to protect ourselves is to hide in the, in the darkness or hide in our brokenness or, or hide in the locked room behind locked doors. And it's safe for us, for us to put ourselves in captivity. It's more comfortable to be in captivity than it is to face our fears head on. We'd rather hide in our fear than expose our fear. We're more comfortable in our fear than we are in boldness. And I think we often do this as well. You know, we're the ones with the key who's locked the door and we're hiding behind it because we're so afraid. We're so afraid of what people might think. We're so afraid of sharing Jesus. We're so afraid of it. So afraid of the things that go on in our world so that what we do, we do. We kind of lose our voice because we hide in the shadows and we hope that no one even really realizes what's going on. This is what fear does to us. It tells us we can't trust people. It, it tells us that we can't forgive people. It, it tells us we can't love people. It says, I can't. Because our whole goal in life oftentimes is how comfortable can we get? And oftentimes the locked door, behind the locked door or the locked room is more comfortable than being in the world, being with the people who betrayed us. So we lock ourselves up because we're so afraid. I think for a lot of us, we're locked in fear. And not just us, I think our world is locked in fear. We're so scared. And do you know what fear does? It, it, fear is, is powerful, right? Fear is powerful. There's power in fear because it causes the most sane and normal people to do some of the craziest and wildest things. It causes us to make irrational decisions or we don't make any decisions because we're so afraid. It's like, I'm gonna leave that up to the experts. I'm gonna leave it up to them. I'm not gonna make a decision or we make irrational decisions because we don't know what to do with the fear that is in front of us. Fear causes us to freeze. Did you ever notice that? Causes us to freeze. Now, I think I've shared this before, but my mom and I are terrified of bees. And not like a, oh, there's a bee run away, like, a, like, like in a very unhealthy way, afraid of bees and wasps. Like, it's, it's not good. Um, there's so many stories. I think I've shared most of them, but there's so many stories of, of me in my car, a bee comes in, and I, like, almost freeze. That's what fear does. When we come face to face with our greatest or deepest fear, what happens is we oftentimes freeze, and we don't even know what to do. When our greatest fear is in front of us, you've seen movies where this scenario plays out, where our hero comes face to face with their greatest enemy or their greatest fear, and oftentimes early in the movie, they freeze. And later in the movie, movie they figure it out. Right? That's kind of how movies go. But fear causes us to freeze. It, it often causes us to give up our morality. It often causes us to give up logical thinking. Because it causes havoc in our lives. It can cause havoc in our businesses and havoc in our churches and havoc in our families. When fear is our motivator. And fear will motivate you to do the wrong things, most often. Fear can derail us. It can cause us to hide because we're so afraid of truly being seen as humans. It causes us to make decisions based on what other people need because we're afraid of their reaction. It can cause us to make poor business deals because we're afraid of letting people down. See, fear causes us to think small. It causes us to act small and feel small because we feel like we're inadequate and we feel like we can't do it because facing our fears is not always easy. 
I think we all can likely look back in our lives and see moments or decisions we made because of fear and the problems they caused in our lives. I think we all have moments we can look back on where fear made us do things or say things because we didn't know what else to do. We were reacting to a problem because fear has the power to shape our future. See, the disciples, they had this deep sense of panic and fear when Jesus had died. If you read through it, they all ran away. There's barely anyone even at the cross. They were scared. Peter was denying Jesus. They were all doing things that they normally wouldn't do, but they didn't know how to respond to the scenario playing out in front of them. The man that they thought would take the throne ended up taking the cross instead. All this fear and panic came up and of, well, what should we do next? As followers of him, they understood that because they were associated with him, that could mean the end of their lives as well. Not just be humiliated, not just die, but be humiliated and brutally killed in the same way Jesus beaten and bruised and destroyed. I think we have to ask ourselves this question is what am I afraid of? What keeps me up at night? What are the things that I'm so afraid of and maybe no one even knows the fear that cripples me at night or the fear that cripples me in the morning? What fear is in our lives. And oftentimes our deepest fears are categorized according to psychologists. Number one would be the fear of extinction, which would be our a fear of annihilation or of ceasing to exist. This is more fundamental way to express it, it than just a fear of death. The idea of no longer being being around and, and our primary existence and our anxiety that comes up and, and all just being people. Consider that panicking, panicky feeling you get when you look over the edge of a high building. The, feast, the fear of extinction. Number two is the fear of mutilation. This is the fear of losing any part of our precious bodily structure, the thought of having our bodies or our boundaries invaded or of losing, uh, of losing the integrity of, of a part of our body, of its natural function. Anxiety that comes from animals or bugs or all this stuff kind of comes from this place where we don't know what it's going to do with this, this, this creepy fear arises that we're maybe going to lose a part of who we are or a part of our body or a part of, 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 of where shame is going to come. And, and the next one, loss of autonomy. The fear of being immobilized, paralyzed, restricted, enveloped, overwhelmed, and trapped, imprisoned, smothered, or otherwise controlled by circumstances beyond our control. In physical form, it's commonly known as claustrophobia, but it also extends to our social interactions and relationships. I was talking to my sister the other week, uh, this week, because my sister ended up going uh, to our kind of old hometown, and she texted me, she's like, I'm just really nervous I'm going to see someone from 10 years ago. I'm so nervous I'm going to bump into someone from high school and it's going to be awkward. That kind of fear that comes up where you see someone in the grocery store you haven't seen in five years. You're like, I might just ignore them. This is that fear that, that it is. The next one is separation. The fear of abandonment or rejection or the loss of connectedness. Of becoming not wanted, not respected and not valued by anyone else. The silent treatment when imposed by a group can have the devastating effect on its target. And the last one here is called ego death, which would be the fear of humiliation, the fear of shame, or any other mechanism of profound self-disapproval that threatens the loss of integrity of the self. The fear of the shattering or disintegration of one's constructed sense of lovability, capability, and worthiness. See, these are some of the biggest fears that we have as humanity. And all of these things, again, there's so much depth in them. But I think we can maybe look and realize that some of these things have started to creep into our own lives where fear is actually what's motivating us to go forward. And what's so interesting is that what scares us the most reveals our deepest insecurities. It reveals our deepest insecurities as people. The things that we fear the most reveal our deepest insecurities. So the disciples there, they've locked themselves behind this door. They've locked themselves in the room. And we can continue the story here. In verse 19, it says, Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. 
Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Now, this part of the story I love because of that word suddenly. Now, I don't know exactly what that like means in the sense of how did Jesus just suddenly appear in the room? Now, it may have been that he, he kind of like floated up from the floor. I don't know, like from, you know, like kind of floated up and there he was. Or maybe they were all sitting in chairs and Jesus all of a sudden appeared in the chair and goes, goes good evening, fellas, right? Like, I don't know how it happened. How did this suddenly moment take place? Jesus just suddenly appeared. And I think for a lot of us, that would probably be one of our deepest fears. You're in a room and all of a sudden someone just appears in the room. But for them, this is why they were in the room. They were so afraid that they'd lost Jesus. Guess who shows up suddenly in the room is Jesus. See, even if we lock ourselves in fear, if we've locked ourselves behind closed doors, Jesus still has this way of showing up. Even if we've given up, even if fear has crippled us and we feel like we can't even go forward, but Jesus has this way of showing up in our hardest and darkest moments to be there for us. You know, fear is real, right? Fear is real. Fear exists. In fact, fear is not something that, 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 is, that is abstract. Fear is something. Even the Bible teaches us, you know, fear the Lord. And, and fear is a part of human story. You know, fear can actually help us when it comes to protecting ourselves when, when we teach kids, like, don't touch the, the red stove because it'll burn yourself. There's this little bit of, I don't want to get hurt, so I'm not going to do things that cause me to get hurt. But do you know what's more powerful than our fear is Jesus? That yes, we may have locked ourselves in the fear, but Jesus will come and he will meet you in that dark moment, even when we're petrified, even when we're scared, he will meet us in that moment. Fear is real, but fear is often a liar. Fear will lie to us. It'll tell us to, to disassociate from people. It'll tell us to walk in isolation. Fear will tell us to give up. Fear will tell us not to get back up and keep on going. Fear will lie to us. Tells us to do things or, or act in certain ways to be safe. When in reality, it is leading us away from the truth, away from peace and away from life. See, Jesus is real and he is the way, the truth and the life. If we want to let something be our motivator, if we want to be, let something be our leader, let's let it be Jesus who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life that will lead us to freedom and lead us to true life rather than fear, which always leads us away from life. Fear will lie to us. Jesus is who we follow. He is the truth that we learn from and the life that we desire to live. Jesus is peace. In the midst of our biggest fears, Jesus brings peace and meets us in our deepest, most crippling fear that holds us back. Jesus is peace. And in fact, again, in verse 21, it says this again. He said, peace be with you. He says it twice. He says, as the Father has sent me, so am I. So I am sending you. See, their greatest fear, what did their fear do? It caused them to stop moving. It caused them to lock themselves. It caused them to stop going. Again, Jesus had sent them out before and he, they'd sent them out and they had done miracles and they came back with questions of how do we do this part and how do we figure this out? He'd sent them out before and they've done it before. They had gone through life and done this work without him before. Yet they had locked themselves in the room. It stopped them from spreading the gospel and it stopped them from spreading joy and it stopped them from spreading peace. It stopped them from love. They had locked themselves out of the great commission to go. And it's a quick reminder of the great commission, for, uh, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
this, this commission, this mission, this vision to go, they had locked themselves in fear because they were so afraid that they stopped going. It's impossible to go when we've locked ourselves in a room. It's impossible to go when we've locked ourselves behind a locked door because we're stuck. And I think sometimes we think that, that someone else has the key to the room, but the reality is you have the key. We've locked ourselves in the room. She says when they went up there, they met behind closed doors. They're the ones who locked the door because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. See, Jesus here needed to reinforce the mission. Go. Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Go. Go into all the world. You've seen me alive. You've seen my wounds. You've seen my hands. You've seen my feet. You've seen my side. You've seen me alive. Now go spread this news across the land. And today we're still living in the faithfulness and courage of those disciples in that room who said, I'm sending you. So they went and now we're still sending people today. The mission isn't over when we're afraid. And I'm going to tell you over the thousands of years, there's been a lot of things to be afraid of. There's a lot of things to be afraid of, but there's a lot of things to be hopeful for. And that's Jesus who came and saved us and rescued us, who died and came back to life so we could be free. That's the mission to go. Yet we're so locked in our fear, we feel like we can't go. We're still living in the, the, the courage of these men in that room. We're here today because of their courage. The courage to unlock the door the courage to step out into the world and be the light, the courage to unlock the door and be the salt. That fear is, might still exist, but we have the courage to unlock the door and take a step of faith. The greatest characteristic of a leader, characteristic of a leader is what? Service. If you want to be a great leader for your family, what do we do? We serve. If you want to be a great leader at work, what's our job? Serve. It's not even about authority. It's not about a position. It's not about a title. It's about service. Serving each other. I want to encourage you to take the courage and unlock the door. And the beauty of this is that we don't go alone. In verse 22, it says this, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't go alone. I think sometimes we're so afraid to open the door. We're so afraid to unlock the door because we're so scared that we're gonna be all alone. The reality is we don't go alone. That when Jesus says, I'm sending you, he says, here's the Holy Spirit to give you power to actually go and do what I've called you to do. We go in the gifts of the Spirit and we go in the fruit of the Spirit. We walk in power and we walk in discipline, right? 2 Timothy 1.7, we know this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Other translations say a sound mind. That's the power we go in, that we don't go alone. We have to stop thinking that we're going through all of this on ourselves. We walk in a spirit of power, but not just power, but love. And not just love, but the ability of self-discipline or making sure our minds are right, that we have a sound mind. We walk in power, love, and self-discipline. That no matter what comes up, we have the tools we need to overcome it. We walk in his power. Joshua 1.9 says this, This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, throughout the scriptures, if you read it, I would encourage you to read it. How many times is this the message? I'm with you wherever you go. 
No matter where you go to the lowest valley, to the highest mountain, I will be there. Be strong and courageous because I'm with you wherever you go. See, Jesus said, go, I'm sending you. Here's the Holy Spirit. Go into the world and spread the good news. Here I am alive and well. It's better that I leave so that you can have the Holy Spirit to go and bring power and love and self-discipline to a broken world. Be strong and courageous. He's Emmanuel. The story of Christmas, God with us. I think a lot of the times we live life as if God's not with us. We don't often walk in his power and we don't walk in his love and we don't walk in discipline of ourselves. God with us. We are never alone. Even in the locked room, even when we're locked in fear, even in our deepest fear, we are not alone. Peace is there with you. The peace that passes all understanding. Peace is the present. Peace is present. I'm going to invite uh, Mike up. I want to encourage you to let's step out in faith. Now you might be listening today, but like, yeah, there, I, you know, I'm not not really struggling with fear. But over the next few weeks, we're going to be going through some other things that we've locked ourselves behind. And how do we break out from it? How do we break out from fear? How do we break out from unbelief? How do we break out from unforgiveness? How do we break out from chaos? How do we break out from comfort? How do we break the lock off so that it never can be lock, locked again? But I think there's some of us, maybe fear is not your thing, but maybe today you're listening or you're hearing fear is something you've struggled with for a long time. Panic attacks and anxiety and feels like any time you think of trying to do something, fear is so crippling. You can't feel like you can't move forward. I'm going to encourage you. Let's take a step of faith. Faith allows us to take the first step out the door. And then the next step brings us into the unknown. And the unknown can be scary. But our futures are on the other side of it to take a step of faith. You know, just over three years ago is when Beth and I, uh, we moved here to Edmonton. It's funny because when I, when I was that age, when I was like in Calgary, there's this big rivalry between Calgary and Edmonton. You know it. It starts with sports, right? And historically, the Oilers have been better than the Flames. Historically. Come our championships. I mean, it's been, I don't even know if anyone sent a text message about the Oilers winning a championship. I don't think so. Probably not. I don't know if it's ever been posted on the internet. You know, I don't know. It's been a long time. But there's this rivalry between Calgary and Edmonton. I remember years ago, I was like, Beth, I'm never moving to Edmonton. Like, I know your family's there and that's cool though. Like, but it's just not for me. It's ugly. For real, this is my thought. I'm just being honest. And I was like, I'm not going there. Like, my life's here. Then three years ago, we felt God call us to Edmonton. And at first I was like, God, like, are you tricking me? You know? Like, is this a joke? Like... And I know he's like, I, I, I want you to give it up. And it's interesting because, to be honest, that was probably the biggest faith step Beth and I have ever made as a family because we had literally just bought our first home in Cochrane. And every day I drive home from work, because we worked in Calgary, I'd drive home and I'd see the mountains every day driving home. Every day as we go for lunch in Canmore, we could walk, you know, 15 minutes and we'd go to the, the river and we just walk by the river. It's peaceful. You know, at, at the time, I was like, man, God, like, I'm, this is the, the dream. Our baby, Jane, was, uh, was, was born July 2020. And we moved here January 2021. She was about six months old when we moved here. At the time, I was like, God, like, everything's going well. Like, God, like, what, like, why this transition, right? Like, what, what do you, like, I, I, I'll be honest, I was scared. I, there was a lot of fear that kind of came up and, and there was a lot of questions and conversations that we had to go through and are like, God, like, is this real? Is this really you? We had those conversations. And, uh, and God was like, yeah, it's, you gotta go. And so we had to take a step of faith. I didn't know what to expect. Like, we didn't know, like, what it fully was gonna look like and there's a lot of fear, you know. I had been 
like, just to be honest, this is the second church in my entire life I've been a part of as a member, ever. Two in my life. So my church in Calgary that I went to, I was dedicated as a baby there. I was baptized there. I grew up there. I went to youth there. I came on staff there. So this is only the second church. So imagine for me, I was like, man, like, like I'm going to my second church of my life and now I'm the leader. Now I make the decisions. Oh, there was so much fear that came up. But there was also this excitement that comes when we step out in faith, when we step out into the unknown, when we let go of something to accept something else. There's a lot of excitement that wells up inside of us. And I think it's to take the first step. You might not feel excited right now, but when we take the first step, we can look out. And that's when excitement comes because we've actually pushed past fear. We've stepped out the door and we're saying, God, lead me wherever you want me to go. And we go and joy comes and peace comes. Has it been easy? No but I won't change it for anything. I won't change it for anything. You know what? You know what's cool about Edmonton? It's a beautiful city. Like there's so much beauty in it. Driving the river valley, it's beautiful. I love our city. I, I love Edmonton. I, I love the people in Edmonton. I love our city. Which to be honest, five years ago, I don't know if I could have said those words. God has me here and has us here for a reason. And we stepped out in faith. I want to encourage you to take a step out of faith. Your family needs a mother who acts by faith and not by fear. You know what our businesses need? They need leaders who walk with courage. You know what our, you know what our church needs? Our church needs a pastor who leads with vision to thrive, not just survive. Your children need a father who doesn't let fear control his actions. Your spouse needs a partner who pushes past fear with boldness to create space for transparency, safety, and honesty and vulnerability. That's what our world needs. Our world doesn't need more fear. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot to be afraid. We need to have things to be hopeful about. You know what I put my hope in? I put my hope in Jesus and I put my hope in his bride, the church. So I put my hope. You know, our takeaway today is this, is it's time to unlock the door and step out in courage. It's our takeaway. Time to unlock the door. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been locked behind, this fear that's crippled you for years. It's time to unlock the door. Take a step. It's not always easy. See, courage isn't the absence of fear. What I think it is, it's just the ability to push past fear. To overcome fear. What's your step of faith? You know what it might be? It might mean to start giving. It might mean to start serving. It might mean quitting your job to start your business that God's placed on your mind for 10 years. It might be applying for school in your late 30s. It might be facing criticism and learning from it. It might be persecution based on your faith or beliefs and sharing Jesus anyway. It might be sharing Jesus with your neighbor. It might be inviting a coworker to church. It might be stopping trying to impress people because what you are doing doesn't line up with your faith. It's a faith that goes against what you believe. It might mean you might lose friends, but we will have peace and we'll have faith. This moment when the disciples have locked themselves in the room, I think the last thing that was on their mind probably was that Jesus was gonna suddenly appear in the room, right? I imagine maybe that's what they hoped would happen. I don't know. But they were there, they're afraid. And they weren't just afraid alone. They were afraid together. They all came together. We're afraid. And then Jesus appears in the room. And this changed everything. It changed everything when Jesus showed up in the room. Because now, rather than being united in fear, they were united in Jesus. First, they were united about their fear. We're scared of the Jewish leaders. What's going to happen? Now they're united about Jesus and they go into the world. And Peter goes and he preaches this incredible message. After Pentecost, you know, few, you know, days, a few days later, you know, a few weeks later, 
That, that, that courage welled up inside of them because they knew the truth and the truth had set them free. And I also want to encourage you, let's step out in faith. Take a faith step this week. It might not need to be something massive. Like, it might be small. It might be small. It might be asking for forgiveness. It might be getting some resources. It might be getting prayer. It might be asking for help. I think sometimes we're so afraid to ask people to help us when we desperately need it. But I want to encourage you, let's step out in faith. Let's, not, let's unlock the door that a, fe- a fear that's holding us back, that's crippling us, that's, that's not allowing us to live the life we were created to live. It might be fear, fear of telling your spouse something that, that you've been doing for a long time. Take a step of faith and allow God to move in your life because Jesus will meet you in your deepest fear. And I know it's scary to step out because that's what fear is, right? It's, a fr- it's scary. But I know you can do it. I went to the CN Tower with my mom September 2019 <laughs> to Toronto. And uh, we hadn't slept the whole night because we had the red eye flight and we, we flew in and we had our bags and we went up to CN Tower with our suitcase. It's crazy. I didn't even know it was possible. Because we showed up, we're like, I hope this works. Anyway, you get up there, if you know the CN Tower, one of the tallest, the, the, I think it's the tallest building in Canada. Um, they have what's called, uh, like, they have this, like, the floors like glass. So you can, like, be up top and you can, it's just glass. So when you look down, all you see is what? Traffic, cement, um, t- taxis, right? Like you see it all, other buildings. And I'm, I'm telling you, now this, this seems so silly, but it's so true. I was exhausted and I see this lady. She's literally laying on the glass as someone's taking her picture, laying on it. And my first thought was like, man, she doesn't even care about her life. Like, you know, poor girl. I was so scared to step on the glass. Now, this is true. And, I, like, I, I, and before this moment, I'd never once been like, I'm scared of heights. Never. Never, never, ever. And I imagine looking. I'm old now, though, right? You got to remember, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm looking down like, yeah, this ain't going to happen. And I remember I walked on it like this. I wasn't going to look down. I took the steps. I'm like, I'm not looking, though, you know? Like, like, God, you got me right. Jesus, take the wheel, right? You know? And I took the steps. Now, again, this seems so silly, but it's so true because sometimes it's something so small that scares us. And all we got to do is take the step. And what does it mean to take the step? It means we trust Jesus that he's going to take care of us when we do it. <laughs> we trust the engineer. We trust the architect who designed it, which is God. Take the step and unlock the door. I want to pray for us today. God, I thank you for this moment. And God, I thank you that there's so much in the scriptures that we can learn about and learn from. And Jesus, we thank you for showing up that day in that room to encourage your friends, to meet them in their fear and not cast judgment, but to bring encouragement, to show them that you are still alive and well. So God, I pray that you do that same thing for us. God, I pray that you meet us in our deepest fear. You meet us in our deepest insecurity. You meet us in the places we've locked ourselves in, the places we've locked our hearts in and we've locked ourselves in. God, I pray you meet us in those moments. You meet us here right now. And God, I pray that as we go through this series, as we talk about some of the things we're locked in, God, I pray that you speak to us, that you reveal yourself to us. And God, I also just really pray that you encourage us because we need it. And God, we pray for our city, the beautiful city of Edmonton. God, we just thank you that you give us a heart for it, a heart for the people to go and not be stuck. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm, I'm excited um, for this series. I, I really pray that some one of the things we talk about will speak to you, but each week we're gonna be going through something else we're locked in and I feel like God uh, was gonna speak something to, to all of us through it.